And then they started talking about what was beneath the skirt. And then it got vulgar. And I couldn't help myself. I turned around and I, and I said to them in Russian, you know, как вам не стыдно? Я понял каждое слово. Which means, you should be ashamed of yourselves. I understood every word. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Maura McCormick was posted to Berlin as a signals intelligence voice interceptor, Russian. Her workplace was the Teufelsberg US listening station, also known as Field Station Berlin. Moira shares her early impressions of Berlin and working at the T-Berg. She also shares her impressions of the infamous James Hall, a United States Army warrant officer and signals intelligence analyst who sold eavesdropping and code secrets to East Germany and the Soviet Union from 1983 to 1988. Mora also recounts a close call with Hussein Yildirim, a Turkish-American auto mechanic who was a Stasi courier for the espionage activities of James Hall. Mora often visited East Berlin and she tells of an unusual close encounter with a chimney sweep that almost resulted in an international incident. In West Berlin, Moira became the first woman to graduate from French commando school and the commandant had to have a nightly call with Paris to confirm that she'd survived the day's training. Now, if you think there is a vast army of research assistants, audio engineers and producers putting together this podcast, you'd be wrong. The podcast relies on your support to enable me to continue to capture these incredible stories and make them available to everyone for free. If you'd like to help to preserve Cold War history and enable me to continue to produce this podcast, you can via a one-off or monthly donation. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more details. You can also join our Facebook discussion group where the Cold War conversation continues between episodes. Just search Cold War Conversations in Facebook. I'm delighted to welcome Moira McCormick to our Cold War conversation. I wasn't ready to go to his, um, I think you would call it an England university. I wasn't ready for college. And I had... Um, a very nice father who would have who worked very hard, who would have spent a lot to put me through school. And I had always had the desire to speak Russian fluently. I had actually been able to take it in high school. And so I thought, you know what? I need a little discipline. I'm not quite ready to do this thing with my peers at a college or a university. So let's see. And when I saw that I could uh, enlist after going through this thing called the D-Lab, it was the, the Defense Language Aptitude Test. You had to pass it. I'm sure you had the, the equivalent. Um, you had to pass that uh, before you could enlist as such. Uh, but once I found out, okay, I'm going to Monterey, California to learn Russian. You kidding me? Yes. So that's why I joined the Army, to learn Russian. And, and why the interest in Russia? Were you interested in the culture or, or what, what was the reason for wanting to learn Russian? It was a book actually in my third or fourth grade classroom. And it was about people from all over the world. And so there were little anecdotes about China and places that, that, that were exotic, that one would never see with different languages and different cultures. And there was something about... Russia, there was something about, at the time I thought, look, this is a, a country that we're always going to need to have a relationship with. And this is a language that could cross over into that. And I want to understand what a samovar is, you know, just, just little trivial things like that. So I just kind of got sucked into the entire culture of it. My favorite U.S. senator at the time was uh, Henry Jackson, who um, was noted for trying to get people out of the Soviet Union. And many of them turned out to be my instructors. So it's kind of just kind of flowed right into there. And Berlin, are you kidding me? Dream. 
Well, we'll come on to Berlin in a in a, in a, in a minute there. What what role did you go into in in I presume it's US Army, yes. yeah? Yes. Um my job title was Signals Intelligence Voice Interceptor Russian. Uh, it was electronic warfare. So that's what I, I did. Right. Must have been a very big business card, that. Very lengthy. <laughs> they had rude nicknames for us. <laughs> so, oh, oh, really? Absolutely. What are they? Uh, uh, Monterey Mary was somebody who had gone to the language school and had spent um, a year and a half in the military. So we were usually at that point at a, a specialist rank. Um so we were showing up with all of that already. Um, we also got called very rude things um, if we were in a tactical situation. Perhaps we better not delve into those. So where were you first posted to? My first permanent post was Berlin. It was uh, to there, even though, um, unbelievably, my tickets actually sent me to East Berlin. Uh, they had messed up when they were doing the military travel arrangements. <laughs> and I was the one that went, wait a minute, I don't really think I'm supposed to be going to Schönefeld Airport. I think I'm supposed to be going to another airport. So that would, that would, that could have really been quite a story had it happened. Um, although I have none others after. It was wild just, uh, coming in. It was, um, I even forget the year. It must have been Pan Am, I guess. And flew in and looked out the window, and it was wild seeing all of those surface-to-air missiles all lined up on the uh, the corridor. Um, arrived at Tegel Airport, was picked up by the U.S. Army people. So I get brought back to from Tegel, which is in the French sector, over to my unit in the American sector. I meet my sponsor there. And my sponsor says, hey, they're having a kegger over at the Vonze. So you're going. Okay. I'm jet lagged, Ian. Everything mm -hmm. is surreal. And I'm like, I'm at the Vonze? I'm at the final solution place? And you're cranking up like, you know, Casey and the Sunshine Band and like, you know, sucking down the suds. You know, what's up with that? So it was a very strange way to enter there because I kept on looking, you know, for the villa. I'd read a little, obviously I'd read up, you know, a little bit on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a very powerful place to visit. I've visited it and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a strange experience. What, what were your first impressions of, of West Berlin apart from being dragged off for a load of beers immediately? Um, I thought that all of the garden plots that they had over by Tegel, I thought these were very impoverished people. I thought people actually lived in those little huts. Um, it was... The air smelled different. It was the fuel, I think, that was burned, you know, the coal. And it was just kind of a whirlwind. You could see that this was a, um, a major city. I didn't get the, the glance of the wall, you know, the first day or anything like that. But I just felt um, it was very alive and it was very gray and it was about 25 degrees Fahrenheit less than it was when I'd gotten on the plane to fly over. <laughs> so I found it very chilly. Yeah. What what time of year was it you were it, it was the summer, Ian. Um, <laughs> it was the end of July. It was right before Charles and January Diana or married. February. It was like 99 degrees Fahrenheit when I flew out of New Jersey. And when I got to Berlin, it was like in the 40s. And I couldn't believe it. Could not yeah. believe it. I, I'm at a complete loss because we're, we're centigrade over here. So I have no idea what that means. But I, I completely understand what you're saying <laughs> about, about it, you know, appearing cold. Wow. And how much did you know about Berlin before you went there? I researched as much as I could. I read um, everything Christopher Isherwood ever wrote. Um, yes, um, I Am a Camera, especially, um, that extraordinary short story. And, of course, there was a whole David Bowie, Iggy Pop thing. And so that was the pop culture part of it for me. And then just history. 
And um, I tried to get myself going through, oh, I forget what it was called. The la- It was either The long- Longest Day or The Last Battle, a Cornelius Ryan book. Yeah, the, it's a, a bit dry is probably an understatement. It's a bit painful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I researched the city as much as I could. And when I was a kid, I always used to love the black and white movies anyway. And there were a lot of them set in, you know, post-war Germany and Cold War Germany. So, but a lot of it I picked up after I got there. And what what did the army brief you before you went there? Were there various do's and don'ts that they told you about before you arrived? Well, you know, I, I'd been granted my clearance at that point in time. So there were many restrictions uh, that were involved. Um, as far as specific behavior in the city, um, no, not until I got there. And then they had a beautiful thing called School of the Soldier. Have you heard about this from other American vets? No, no, I don't think I have. Oh, this is And great. even if I have, I want to hear it from you. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. <laughs> okay, after you show up, what uh, happens is, okay, um, you've got a few days, and then the first uh, duty day, uh, you are sent to a two-week class called the School of the Soldier. And I was the only female in in the entire class, which was lovely. Um, okay. And we went over to uh, another caserna, which was McNair, which reminded me of like, I felt like General Patton and Ike were going to just like drive through at any moment. So that was pretty cool. And it was basically, you better behave yourself or you're going to get yourself kicked out of the city. And you name it, behavior in the West, behavior in the East, um, the usual horrifying graphic, um, how shall I put it, don't mess around with the Thai girls um, videos and pictures and briefings (laughs) where I had three million eyeballs on me because they all swiveled at me like, how's she going to take this one? I just, you know, you do the blank face. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've seen that before. Seen whatever. It all before, yeah. Very funny. Um, and we got little bus tours. So we went over to Potsdamer Platz and we got to do the, you know, the classic look over where you just, you're just astounded. Um, and you're trying to take it in. Uh, you know, and then just, you know, the little, the little bus tour, the very careful bus tour over to the east. And that was how the school of the soldier ended. So your your deployment is on the Teberg or Teufelsberg. What what can you tell me about that? Um, Teufelsberg was a national security agency um, operation. We were on a, a Teufelsberg um, was the Devil's Mountain. It was built from the rubble um, of World War Two. It's the highest place uh, in West Berlin possibly in Berlin itself. And um, an awful lot of us worked six and two rotating shift there. Um, It was a, uh, how we were transported there uh, was from our caserna in the American sector. And then we would go over to the British sector and then we would go up and we would start our shifts. There was um, always, there were four teams and there were three that were on, and there was always one that was off. And I was on Team 3. Right. And and your role was listening to the transmissions and translating them, was it? Or or, or what were you – What can you can you tell me much of what you were doing or not? Mm, not really. It's probably no, that's fine. known. That's fine. Well, I think, yeah, I certainly with other people I've spoken to – who've worked in the area of signals intelligence, um, I tend to uh, reach a dead end when I start questioning them. In. So what exactly were you doing? They, Ian, they, um, Ian, they got yeah. us young. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that, 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 that's fine. Um, but I understand Santa Claus had some problems on the T-Berg. Oh, yes. Yes. Um we were working uh, the mid-shift, uh, 11.30 at night to 7.30 in the morning. Um, and uh, one uh, one guy decided that he was going to be Santa. Uh, so he grabbed one of our sacks, uh, one of the burn bags, 
um, and went around, you know, saying ho effing ho, um, you know, merry effing Christmas, you know, all the usual stuff. And he was kind of a character to begin with, a little goofy. Um, and somebody slyly uh, slipped a top secret code word document into Santa's sack. Um, we always had to have our bags and our persons. If we were carrying anything, we would be checked by, by the MPs there, to be sure, just because of what we did. And on the way in and on the way out. And he was carrying the sack, sack and wearing the fake beard and looking goofy. And they were like, well, we got to look into that. And he said, well, whatever happened to your spirit of Christmas? And then they looked in and, and oh, no, they found the document. So Santa got busted for a security violation and interrogated until about two or three o'clock in the afternoon, Christmas Day. Wow. Wow. Yeah, nobody ever fessed up to doing that, but I, you know, we all have our suspicions about who did it. Yeah, it's probably still an official secret. I think it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, were you there when Carney was at the T-Bird, the guy who was the American soldier who was the Stasi agent? Um, him, no, but Hall, yes. Right. And did you have to work with him at all or know know him uh yeah i did um hall i knew him he was a yeah. puke he was a puke smart yeah i'm not i'm not familiar with that term no, oh okay <laughs> a puke I, um, I need i need subtitles oh i, I apologize for the no, uh, that's vernacular fine. no that's great <laughs> okay a puke is just somebody who's pretty much worthless um okay. it makes you want to puke the the thought of them um, his name was Hall. He'd gotten all the, uh, the nice promotions. Um, sweet deal. The warrant officer. Um, he decided he was smarter than everybody else in the world. And as it turned out, he pretty much compromised everything. There was a book written by a uh, Colonel Harrington about it. Yeah. I, and I knew Hall. Um, he would always get in your face and, um, get a get a mush get a horrible expression on his face if you didn't enthusiastically contribute to either the boy scouts or the cub scouts or whatever wholesome thing it was that he was but he was such a jerk you know you just were like if, you, if you're trying to get me to, to to donate to something positive like that you know the girl scouts mm -hmm. the boy scouts you know be decent about it and he just always had this air about him um Never hung out with him, knew the guy that uh, he reported to who went through hell after everything came out. But it always astonished me that the ones that got the best deals from the military, uh, promotions, you name it, um, seemed to be the ones that turned against it, I guess because of arrogance. I can't figure it out. Were you there the day that they announced that he'd been arrested or or was caught. well no actually he went back to the u.s didn't he, he yeah you know i will always remember this i was i was in bedminster new jersey i was buying um i was in a bookstore and i saw the harrington book uh and i went wait a minute i'm familiar with this unit so i bought the book and i started reading it and about the third chapter in is when i found out what this guy who I was not in the least impressed with. Uh, so you weren't aware at the time that he'd been arrested? No. It was when only when you saw this book that you Correct. discovered, wow, that must have been a hell of a shock. Uh, yeah, you know, and especially when you found out the way that it went through. The Turk, uh, the, uh, the, the the guy at the, uh, the, the, the machine the, shop. The garage guy. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I went over one time, I even forget what it was for. I was kind of thinking maybe it might be nice to get a car. Um, and I walked in and talked to this guy briefly. And he offered, um, well, first off, he said, you know, I can get you a really nice car. Okay. And then he said, you know, the best way to do this, though, is for me to take you out to dinner along with my girl, and I got a look on my face, and he said, well, with my girlfriend, I got a glimpse of girlfriend. Girlfriend didn't look too good. Girlfriend didn't look too nice at all. Um, and it'll be over in the East. It'll be a great restaurant. And I just was, 
nonplussed. I didn't really even know what to say. And uh, I said, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. And he's like, I can get a BMW for 500 marks for you. It might be worth the dinner or something to that effect. And I pretty much hightailed it out of there, never reported it, never went ever remotely close to that place. And I regret it to this day that I did not report that. Do you think he knew what area you were working in so that uh, it made sense for him to try that enticement? I would think so. He um, he asked me what I did and I, and I and I said I, I was, you know, I forget. I was I was the secretary to the colonel. I said something, you know, along those lines. But when you looked at who was actually on that caserna and how many women were there, his chances with women, chances were good they were from my unit. And he would have found out awfully quickly if it was a female a military policeman, you know, for example. Um, they were the only other women, really, that were on my caserna. At the time, did you think that he was trying to recruit you or were you worried that it was some sort of criminal enterprise or, or just that he was creepy? The latter. The latter. I did not feel the recruiting feel at all. Um, I thought he was hitting on me. Um, actually, it was really creepy. And that's why the girlfriend kind of came into it. There was there was that that vibe to it, um, which was very disgusting. <laughs> um, very unattractive man, very unattractive girlfriend, very unattractive concept. But I never got that sense. Had I, I would have reported it. Thanks for that. That is absolutely fascinating. Um, Yildirim was one of the key Stasi operatives in West Berlin, and he recruited a number of uh, U.S. Army soldiers into his uh, network. And to hear an eyewitness account of somebody who he attempted to recruit as well is absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that. Did you have much dealings with the Brits? Actually, yes. Over on site, um, I did. Um, the Falklands War was happening and while I was up there. Uh, we were able to um, put up um, not only AFN signal, but you know other radio stations. And um, like when Prince William was born, I remember, you know, standing, waiting in the mess hall and it was like, it's a boy. Um, I could let, you know, I could let the fellows know. And um, the same thing with the Falklands. Uh, we could listen to it and, you know, at lunchtime or at, at any meal during this conflict, um, you know, the fellows would, would come over and they would, they would ask um, if we, if we knew anything, if we had heard anything, because they, it was it was a bit stricter for them. They 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 were not permitted to do that, and so we just give them updates on it. Um, so there was that, um, and then there was also the hmm, let's try to learn your vernacular kind of thing. Okay. Uh, we could communicate, um, <laughs> and we used to try to communicate with each other um, using the uh, fairly primitive system that we had, and we just send messages off like, "Hey, we need to talk." And um, the answer that would always come back would be, you know, toss off. And um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I didn't know what it meant. I had no idea. And so we're in line. And this is after like, you know, oh, yeah, you know, like, you know, they're taking the baby to Australia or something like that. And hey, what does toss off mean? You know, and this poor man <laughs> was just completely discombobulated. I just I mean, he explained it. But I was just like, oh. <laughs> so did you uh, go in the naffy as well? Oh, I adored the naffy. The tea, everything. And, and um, how things were different. A fish sandwich, um, cream slices. Um, but it was the tea. We lived on the tea. And, um, and the little sandwiches. And pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. Yeah. But it uh, it just cracked me up, you know, like being behind some guy where he's going like, okay, well, um, I want two fish sandwiches and a zit. Uh, <laughs> it was it was the lemon soda, the zitrona. Um, but I didn't know that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, they always say, don't they, it's two nations separated by a common language. <laughs> I agree. So, uh, I mean, you mentioned that you did an, an acclimatization trip 
in in the east early on with that uh, soldier school or whatever it yeah I can't remember what it was called now. Um, but did you go over there to uh, shop as well? Oh yes, um, we called it Monopoly Money, Ian. What you could do is you had the official rate of exchange between the East German mark and the West German mark was one on one, but you could go to Bonnefso, um or, or any any exchange. And you get basically a nine to one, ten to one on it. And when the dollar was doing well, which it was, you would, I would go over there to shop just to kind of take it in, get a meal, the usual. And um, so many, so many things would happen shopping. That's that was the best way to interact with with East Germans. The most interesting time going shopping was um, at the. Um, it was near the Spittelmarkt. It was like a, a sports store, and you could get all of the stuff for the young pioneers. And I was standing in line, and I'd bought, an, I don't know, I'd bought maybe a tennis racket, you know, for like 20 cents or whatever, you know, just little things. Mm. And um, all of a sudden, I felt people just kind of poke me. It wasn't a mean poke. Uh, it was just a little touch. And it happened about three times and the first time I turned around and I was like what like what's going on and it kept on happening and then I finally realized I'm an American in uniform we always had to be in uniform when we went over there and that's all they want to do there's no there's no bad coming out through this so I just stood there and went okay which was completely counter to Another trip with a friend where we were like walking down Winter Den Linden and a, a busload of Czech tourists came in and the looks in their face, Ian, oh, good God, we were the devils incarnate. We were, we were, we were the, the imperialists that you just, you know, horrifying, horrifying, hideous creatures. Um, but we, we, we like to shop there. It was quite the bargain. I can imagine. And I think you were over in the East um, when Yuri Andropov died as well. Uh, Yes. Yes. What was that like? That was actually something we had been briefed on. That was strange. All of a sudden, the bells began to toll. And everything got very, very tense. And you knew what it meant. Um... You knew that something like that meant that that a major leader had died. I, I just didn't know whether it was going to, going to be Hani or whether it was going to be on drop off. And then it began to happen. And we have been told, listen, don't let any news crew come near you. Don't talk to anybody. Don't give any comment. You know, you're not the State Department. Don't do this thing. So, yeah, that happened when I was there. Um and we just left as quickly as we could. It was, you didn't know what was going to happen next. And you didn't really yeah. want to be on the wrong side of the wall. No, no. I mean, bearing in mind your role and the location, you know, your workplace, I'm surprised that you were allowed to travel to the East. Presumably your uniform didn't betray anything about what your role was. Well, we, um, you'll love this. We, um, we had to go in groups of five. Um, we needed to have a non-commissioned officer or a commissioned officer of a certain rank who was in charge of the group. Um, and, um, we would take off our, um, our branch, um, insignia. However, since none of the other units in the United States occupying force were told to remove their branch insignia. It really didn't take too much to figure out who we were. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah. I can imagine. I mean, you know, I've, I've heard how good the Stasi were, but this was uh, probably not a, a difficult deduction for them that there was something special about you. Yeah, you know, plus there were, you know, a lot of women, you know, and that, that probably gave it away too, let's face it. You know, a lot of women in uniform, a lot of women were in my unit. 
And I, I understand you had a run in with a couple of Russians at the top of the TV tower. Oh, with the base going to the top. Yes. Um, it was another East trip and uh, it was with a group. And all we were doing was waiting for the elevator to go up. We had reservations. And okay. And there were these two Russian uh, fellows uh, behind me and they were talking. And they were like, oh, look. Oh, it's, a, it's an American soldier. Oh, look, she's like, she's, everything was diminutive. Uh, so it's like, um, oh, it's a little soldierette. Oh, 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 and look, she has a little hattie and, and, and she's a little skirty and, and, and she's got a little, look at the little gloveys that she's got and everything. And okay. So I'm just standing there like, all right, you know, whatever. Um, and then they started talking about the skirt. And then they started, started talking about what was beneath the skirt. And then it got vulgar. And I couldn't help myself. I turned around and I, and I said to them in Russian, you know, which means you should be ashamed of yourselves. I understood every word. And they were horrified. They, they were chagrined. <laughs> oh, that was brilliant. I'd la- that's one of those ones where you just think, oh, I wish I'd, you know, somebody had filmed that. It, it was wonderful at the time, actually, because I just, it got, it, it, if it not, if, had it not gotten incredibly vulgar, I wouldn't have done it. But yeah. what wound up happening, Ian, was after that, um, we all get up to our table, one of those tables with the wonderful view, the fake flowers in the vase with the microphone right by the fake flowers, one of those. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they sent over a bottle of sect over to our table um, as a way of apologizing. <laughs> so. Well, they were probably concerned that you might report it to their commanding officer or something like that, I guess. Anything is possible. Anything yeah. was possible then. Yeah, because, I mean, Berlin must have been a really cushy posting for the, for the Soviets as well. And the last thing they w- would have wanted would have been to you know, sent to guard some isolated place in Siberia. Oh, exactly. Or posted to Afghanistan. Yeah, we'd mess with them at the checkpoints about that. Uh, No, agreed. Agreed. Sorry, you said you messed with them at the checkpoints. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, When you, um, as you know, but not everybody does, um, Charlie was the one that got you from West Berlin into East Berlin. Bravo got you from West Berlin to East Germany. And then Alpha was where East Germany and West Germany met. But going through Bravo, you could drive through uh, that one road that we were allowed to drive through on that Autobahn. And uh, when we would drive through on our uh, trips out to what we would call the zone, the occupied zone, uh, sometimes it would be like, you know, the weather's... uh, not too, not 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 too bad here. It's probably better than it is in Afghanistan. And you just see these, oh, the poor, you know, we really should, probably shouldn't have done it. They were like 18, 19 years old. They were scared to death that they were going to mess something up. And you have these uh, snotty Americans, uh, you know, speaking their language and saying that to them. But we would do that. I understand you, you were you were quite a big hit with some youngsters with your Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Oh, yes. When I was in my, my major capitalist imperialist uh, persona, yes. Yeah, it sounds like it from the description you've given here. But, you know, do share it with us. It was so much fun. Um, I've been doing it for every East trip that uh, I've been permitted to go to. Um, you always had a pack of Marlboro Reds and... Um, you always had a big pack, the biggest pack you could find to Wrigley Spearmint Gum. That's what we were told, um, that those were, were two things that you could barter. Um, and so I had this big 32-piece, 64-piece, whatever, the biggest thing I could get. And I saw the little pioneers go by um, across the street from um, Alexanderplatz. I was over by the Russian gift, gift store, not far away from there. And those hard buildings with the, like, the, the bathroom tiles, the loot, you know, like, you know, just, this, just the hard looking buildings. They were, they were going by there. Big long row of uh, all these kids and their, and their teachers and their pioneer leaders. And so I just chose a little boy and I handed the, the whole thing over to him. 
And I said, this is, this is for you, all of it, in, in what little German I could speak. And alles alles ist für dich, aber du kannst mit alles, you know, the other, you know, so I'm basically saying, it's up to you. You can keep it or you can share it. But this is yours. This is my gift. Geschenk. And they went nuts. It it caused a bit of a commotion. It was so lovely. Um, but he had a dilemma. Um, and that's kind of what I was trying to put into him. You know, it could have been any kid. Just to go, I, I get the way you're being raised. I get the way that you live. But there is a possibility. And now you get to choose. Um, so I did that. But, yeah, they were not happy with me. I can imagine the uh, pioneer leaders being uh, not enjoyed no, with with them talking with them talking to you. Um, you. You've also got this lovely story about the chimney sweep. Oh yeah, one of the big places um, that you would go. There was a flag shop where everybody would get all of their um, East Block um, flags and a, and a China place, and it was just right out of a movie, and it was fabulous. Uh, you had um, the little back room with all the good stuff, the secret room with the big heavy curtain and everything else. And, okay, I'd, I'd done the China shop thing a couple of times. All right, fine. You know, it, 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 wasn't, it, was, it wasn't my thing. But there was a bakery there. And since we'd been delayed uh, so long waiting around for the Vopos to figure out that, hey, you know, just – let us go. We're not going to say anything, you know, just, just, you know, you messed up. That's all. Um, so I got in line and I just got like a loaf of like that very rustic, you know, the farm bread. And there was a chimney sweep that was there. And he was like out of a Dickens book, the whole getup, um, you know, the black clothes, you know, the sooty face, you know, the big top hat, you know, the whole nine yards. And he went up to me. Um, after I'd gotten a loaf of bread and stood in line and he said, why'd you do that? And I just, I just said, you know, like, you know, I'm hungry and I'm not even sure what the emotion was, but something happened inside of him and, and he gave me a hug. He just reached down and he pulled me closer to him and I was very frightened for him. I was, I was in uniform. Um, this was not, this wasn't, you know, it wasn't cool. It, it, it wasn't cool. He wasn't old enough for, for where he would be okay. And he wasn't young enough to where he didn't give a crap. He was, he was at that age. And, um, what wound up happening, um, was that, okay, you know, the mysterious, uh, buying, buying the China thing was done for a couple of people. The guy leaned down and he was, he was going to kiss me. Um, until, um, one of my fellow imperialists, you know, came out and, uh, jumped right after her and it's, you know, what the hell is this? Um, and I thought he was going to clock him. I thought he was going to clock my, ch I was, this, 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 this poor chimney. You know, I thought the chimney sweep was going to hit the dirt. And of course there was a crowd. There's always a little crowd. And I stopped. Um, my protector from doing the violent thing. Um, and basically we just hustled out of there as fast as we could. It had to have been caught on camera, Ian. There, there were so many witnesses. I can, I can, I'm trying to think of the newspaper headline, you know, U.S. soldier attacks proletarian chimney sweep in East Berlin or something. I don't know. See what I mean? Yeah. It it really could have gone bad. But yeah. but the other way could have gone bad too. You know, proletarian yeah. chimney sweep, you know, um convinces um western decadent woman that the pure life and socialist life is the way to go. You know, I mean it could Oh, that sounds like a much better story. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Now, I think you mentioned to me in the uh, previous conversation we had that you had a close encounter 
with East German leader Eric Honecker. Yes, yes. Um, there were actually five of us in the car, and none of us actually got to speak with him. But this was in the beginning of um, yet another trip over, over across the wall, over into East Berlin. And when we drove through, we were in a Volvo. Yeah, it, was a, it was a mustard-colored Volvo. It didn't really look that official to me. But it was a Western car. And when we turned on to um, get ourselves over by Alex... Uh, as we were going down um, Unted in Linden um, and going past party headquarters, there were all these strange roadblocks. And our car was directed into a courtyard that was behind party headquarters. I'd never noticed it. I never would notice it had we not been directed there. And we didn't really know what was happening. We just sort of went, okay, uh, sort of sat there. And then we saw some limousines pull up. And out of one of those limousines came Eric Honecker, a very short man, um, which didn't surprise me. I'd heard of it, but he was a very tiny man, very powerful man. Uh, and he went into a side entrance, a back entrance, a party headquarters right there. At that point, the Vopos went insane, jumping up and down, banging on our, on our windows, uh, wanting us to roll down the windows. Um, what we did was we just cranked up Journey as loud as we could, and I think we gave them the finger until they stopped. <laughs> and they finally went, okay, you know, and they let us go. But it, it started off the day. It sounds like they mistook your Volvo for one of the uh, party higher-ups Volvos, because the Volvo was a very popular car for the East German leadership. That's exactly what we thought. That's exactly what we thought, that there were dignitaries that were coming all over the place for something that we didn't even know about and that we had gotten roped in and they just didn't quite know what to do once they realized that these uniforms that were being worn <laughs> were not exactly the uniforms that they'd expected to see. Now, another thing you mentioned to me was some unease you had with your transport to the Teufelsberg when you were being taken to work there. Can you tell me more about that? Yes, yes. Um, it, it got to be kind of a, a, a bit of dark humor between me and a couple of other people that I used to uh, used to ride the trick bus on. And um, the access road to Teufelsburg, there's one road. That's it. There's no other road. Uh, our buses took, in essence, we had buses coming from three different locations uh, for each shift. Um, all of those buses at one point or another, at, at predictable times, would have to cross over this particular area going through the Grunewald. And we all were just like, well, if the Red Army faction wants to get us, we're sitting ducks. And so there were days where we did feel a bit of unease about the whole thing, even though the activity from what we could tell, well, there were demos that were happening in Kreuzberg, for example. Um, the big action was out in the, uh, the Western Zone you know, but around these Baden and Frankfurt. Was this after the RPG attack on US General Crozen, I think it was? I honestly forget. You know, this was before that. This was when there was the, 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 the soldier who was kidnapped for his ID card. Um, I honestly forget his name, but it was reported in Stars and Stripes. And this is what, what got us nervous, that you would... He went out to a club... He got drunk. He got stupid. He got picked up by somebody who was an unfriendly, a very unfriendly, as it turned out. They killed him for his ID card. And we were like, well, we get drunk and stupid, too. Hmm. This is not good. And it, it, it affected a lot of us. And it was like, well, if I'm going to set up any kind of an ambush, why not right here where all these people are going up? So it was in the back of your mind. Was the bus you were on guarded and... Was it easily identifiable? Well, it was actually a, a very fancy U.S. Army bus. It was a beautiful uh, German Mercedes bus, uh, painted the Army green, um, and the drivers were all German nationals. And d did you manage to speak to many East Germans on a one-to-one -one basis? As much as I could, I did. It was tough. Um, I found that the East Germans who would speak to you were the retired ones, the older ones, because um, they just didn't care what, what was going to happen. They were going to get kicked out and they were going to get put in the West. 
Um, yeah, yeah, well, they could already travel to the West anyway if yeah. they were pensioners. So, yeah. They weren't risking anything. No. Um, so a little with them were, you know, you'd sit and you'd, you'd drink the uh, the fake coffee, um, the horrid fake coffee that they had. Um and it was always an older person that would sit next to you. If you'd get a beer, uh, it was always an older person who would sit next to you and just try to talk. Um, and the younger people, especially the punks, um, they didn't care either. Uh, and so with them, it was uh, with music. I was trying to immerse myself in everything. It was a whole new city. It was a whole new continent. Uh, so much, so much to learn. Uh, and so I'd ask them, like, you know, what, what, what's the best music? what's what's the best group and it was great you know or um you know what's the best propaganda what's the bullshit um and and they would just go you want this one you don't want that one you want to buy this one no and i'm like you know what's the dreckiest of the dreck you know basically and it's like oh yeah yeah, yeah you know taunts with pioneer and sing sing with sing with the pioneers you know like yeah you want to listen yeah. to that one you know um so yeah, um and where did you meet these people? Did they just come up to you in the well, it it sounds like you, you know, with the the older people you said if you sat down with a beard some somebody would come down and sit next to you, but the young kids, I guess, you know, they're hanging around and, and Yeah. They just... Um they're hanging around. Some would some were bold enough and they would hang around Alex, but not many. Yeah. Um you would usually find them um in like the little side what do you call it? like their, their equivalent, I guess, of a, of a little food court, a uh, little mm-hmm. restaurant, imbus uh, kind of a thing. Um, you would find them uh, there with the younger ones. I'd usually find the younger ones up where the um, Amiga <laughs> music was. That was mm-hmm. where they would be um, talking. They were very bold. They didn't try to look. They didn't do the look around to make sure there weren't too many people around when you had the American next to them and they would like to talk. And mm-hmm. again, it would just be, um, you know, what's the music or they'd ask for a Lucy. Um, that's where the Marlboro, a, a loose, a loose cigarette is a Lucy. Uh, so they would ask for a Lucy from the Marlboro oh, okay. pack. Thank you for the translation. I would just always, I would always just think anybody who approached me was brave. Because they were. Absolutely. I mean, you know, an American soldier in uniform, um, it's not as though you're exactly blending in. Did you ever think that some of those approaches might be for trying to gain some information about you, particularly with the older older people, possibly? I never really took that from that. Um, perhaps I was naive. Um, but since I wasn't going to give any information other than like basic things, if you were going to buy a scarf, which one's the better scarf, you know, things like that, you know, um, I never, it could have been, Hey, for all I know, the chimney sweep, it could have been to set up an incident. Who knows? Great disguise though. You got to. You know, you've got to take your hat off to them for that one. (laughs) (laughs) Literally. The top, take the top hat off to them. Absolutely. (laughs) How on earth did you manage to get into French commando school? Oh, isn't that trippy? Okay. Um, My sponsor um, was part of um, a a group that had to do with with plans and training. And um, she worked all days. And uh, during that, that kind of foggy period when I first arrived in city, um, somehow or other she found out I spoke French. And what had been happening was that one of the beautiful benefits of, of being in Berlin was that both the British, um, as well as the Americans and the French, uh, could go through the commando training. And, uh, British, uh, groups went through it all the time, um, as did Americans. Uh, in this instance, they were looking for translators uh, to make the school go um, more easily. And they looked to my unit, um, the one that worked at Teufelsberg, uh, because they knew that they had people that spoke like Russian and German. And they thought maybe there would be people that spoke French. And so me and a guy from my unit got uh, 
that we both spoke French, got uh, a guy asked, hey, well, you know, you want to do this thing as their interpreters? And it was like, yeah, sure. And then I thought, you know what? We're having like a week. They're having like 10 days training, you know, moving up to it and everything else like that. If I'm going to interpret for these guys and if I'm going to, it was an infantry platoon. Um, if I'm going to be doing it for these guys, um, why don't I go through some of what they're going through? And then when I can't do it anymore, you know, then I'm not going to do it anymore. So every day I would do these crazy, insane things and uh, to train. Like what? Like what, what, what were the crazy things you were having to do? Oh, wow. Oh, rappelling. Um, doing all these jumps off of high buildings. It was mostly like um, confidence courses, uh, things like that. But it was mostly um, height, most of very high up, doing stuff from very high up, um, learning things like that and just going, okay, um, I'm actually afraid of heights. This is going to be great. And <laughs> so um, every day I, I would somehow manage to get myself through whatever training they were putting us through um, to get ready for it. And I get back black and blue to my unit and go, okay, well, let's see how long this lasts. And I managed to make it through all of that. And I figured, well, you know, what the hell? Might as well do it in the school too. And don't ask me how. But I managed to be the first woman who ever uh, got the award. So you're the first woman to graduate from French commando school. Yes, sir. Well, I feel even more honoured to uh, speak with you today. <laughs> it was pretty wild, actually. I, I have never in my life experienced pain like that. Um, I was black and blue from, I'd say, the my chin all the way down to my toenails by the end of it. Wow. Do you well, want me to tell you about it? Yeah, go on. Okay. Um, well, what happens in this school is what they are training you to do um, through all different kinds of things is, 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 is small group warfare so that a group of five people uh, can do what needs to be done um, again, in, in a small group, you know, inserting in and inserting out kind of a situation. So one day we got to lie in the road and we got run over by tanks, which flipped out a whole bunch of people. Um, other days, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You can't, you can't just say we were run over by tanks without explaining. So I, I presume you were run over, but you were between the tracks. Correct. As they went over you. Okay. Correct. <laughs> no, we didn't get. Sm <laughs> no, we didn't get. Um... Yeah, yeah, you'd be more than black and blue with that. <laughs> no, they didn't call the herd that way. <laughs> so... I wasn't sure whether you were at maybe in a slit trench or something like that with a tank going over you or. <sighs> no, they did that just to kind of get us. No. Yeah. We were in between the tracks. Uh, but the purpose of having us being run over by the tank, um, as, as it was put, or however you want to put it, having, having a tank roll over you, perhaps is a more accurate description, was to see exactly where it was where you were going to put your charge that was going to blow up this tank. And then how you could roll away from it and get used to that. So we were training things like that. Under war, I mean, under under the earth things where you would have to have, um, you know, way, way, way deep down. You'd have to dig yourself in. A lot of it was climbing. Uh, my favorite probably was, uh, I called it a slide for life, but they call, they, now they're popular. Um, the, um, you know, where you, where you grab the line and then you, then you pretty much go over water, rocks, whatever it might be, um, a zip line. Now, in, in, in U.S. Army Ranger School, I am told that, yes, they do this thing, that you grab onto the, the zip line and then you drop yourself from a height into the water and then you have to swim yourself back. Well, the French were by far more diabolical than that. Um, this was over rocks. This was not over water. This was not one of those things where you're halfway through it, where you could just say, "Uh, oh, you know what? I think I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I held on to that thing so hard 
that um, I was unable to let go in time and, and just made not a three point land, you know, I mean, just, just planted right on my behind, you know? Uh, so I got real bruised that day, but they would just put us through things like that. Yeah. Uh, was this training for units that were going to be defending Berlin or was it just general small unit training? Um, it was only for units that were defending Berlin. The units that were in there were mm, three infantry and um, combat engineers. Oh, and we had we had the armors. We had um, a group from the 40th Armor, too. So, yeah. Right. And so this was urban warfare sort of training? Yes. They were. Yeah. Although they did take us out um, to um, Goslar in West Germany, well, in Germany now. Um, an incredible, like medieval town, just, 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 just right up a postcard, one of Hitler's favorites, sadly. And that's where the, um, in the field part of it went. So we had pretty miserable, pretty miserable Thanksgiving that year, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Did you exercise in Doughboy City as well? That, no. Okay. Heard lots of stories about it. The closest that I can give you is... Um, we would qualify on our rifles in Tempelhof at the firing range there. Right, right. No, somebody's posted a great aerial photo of it on the Facebook group. Mm. Um, and it, it's a really interesting site. I mean, the site's been flattened now. But, you know, they they sort of had an S-Bahn station, a mock S-Bahn station with a, a couple of S-Bahn carriages up on an embankment. As well, you know, there was a lot of effort gone into, uh, you know, creating the accuracy there. Oh, yeah. Well, any guy, any look, the guys that were um, in the brigade, they had a tall job to do. When you think of how many of us there were compared to how many of them there were and who we were surrounded by that we knew. Oh, yeah, they they. They really worked hard. They, it, it was a tough life. Yeah. Have you, you might not have listened to it. I interviewed a, a guy who was a private in the um, British Army in Berlin, and he talks about, you know, his life expectancy if the Soviets and the East Germans had, had come over the wall to uh, attack them. And it's a really, it's a really interesting interview. You, you might quite, quite enjoy it. I'll, uh, I'll send you the link to it. Oh, great. Um, cause it's, it's a, it's a really interesting story and I'm still in contact with him. He's, he's constantly messaging me with various bits and pieces. So it's one of the nice things about this podcast is I've, I've somehow got these friends all over the place now off, off the back of it. Um, with the, with the, sorry, just going back to the French army, um, what, what was, how different was it actually being with them? Because, I mean, I've heard that they had wine with their meals. Is that true? Oh, yes. And they, oh, oh, being in the field with the French was was divine. It was fabulous. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd get this cold, cruddy stuff and we'd be trading off. And um, our chow, was, you know, it gave you the calories, but it didn't really give you that je ne sais quoi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the... Uh, even the even the mess hall um, in the in the in the in the French uh, caserna, the food was fabulous. I gained weight going through commando school. That's how good the food was. That's scary, wow. actually, given how much I was I was doing. Um, there was brandy that was part of your rationed. Um, there was wine that was brought uh, by the um, their equivalent of you know their cooks. And they would prepare these like blowout things. And if you couldn't have that, their food was so good. It was just so civilized. You know, it was just yeah. like, wow, I definitely joined the wrong army just for, just for that. But it was, <laughs> it was wonderful. And just sitting around the fire and just like, you know, having, having a bottle and just passing it around was great. But it sounds like your ideal army is to, you know, eat, and, and drink with the French, have some British tea as well. And uh, I, I mean, I've heard that the US food was, was pretty good, certainly from British guys that I've spoken to. Yeah, we um, we always made fun of it. Um, 
of course. Um, the, the favorite, um, the favorite thing on the, on the official U.S. Army menu was jello and onions, which just killed us every time. Can you imagine? Yes. Well, actually together. Yes, actually together. To, to the point, we, I, I remember it vividly, where I actually went up to the cook and said, green jello with onions. And it's like, yeah, he's like, it's on the official menu. I'm like, so what am I getting? A dessert and a vegetable? Like, like what's up with this? Yeah. And he really couldn't answer it. I can see why you preferred. <laughs> I can see why you prefer the French menu. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> wow. But uh, no, for um, the Air Force, they uh, they actually had the best um, dining hall going. Um, I would say. Yeah, I would say. I mean, you you mentioned I think before we um, started this chat about uh, you know you reading the books of Christopher Isherwood. And and did you explore his haunts in Berlin? Oh yes, um, that was a labor of love. Actually, um, I did the Schönberg part first because Kreuzberg had a reputation uh, when I was there. There were a lot of anti-American demos and th- things of that nature. A lot of squatters. Um, I loved it, by the way. Doing my Isherwood walk, um, I found where he had lived in Kreuzberg, and then discovered. Uh, right over by Corpusator, um, Corpusadam, um, over by the Landwehr Canal, that I loved it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. So as I would retrace Isherwood or Herr Isivu and then read what he'd written, um, I, I, I would just like thank him, where it would just be like, I cannot believe that I found the most beautiful, beautiful street. In Berlin, thanks to you. Um, so I did that. I did that. My my dad was a big one into the spy novels. So every once in a while, where there was like a new uh, you know Berlin uh, novel, generally from a British author, he just go, "Could you go to this bar where Bernie Gunther goes? <laughs> Could you go where Smiley is? Yeah, Dad. Yeah, yeah. You know, take a picture, send it to him." Oh dear. So your dad was a fan of like John Le Carre and Len Dayton. And, yes. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. yes. Yeah. Incredible and evocative um books. Um have you ever seen the film Wings of Desire? It's my favorite film. Oh, same here. Same here. Of I all think time. it's just a brilliant portrait of nineteen eighties Berlin as well. It caught my sitting. Yeah. Yeah. Als das Kind war wie ein Kind, der hat gesagt, warum bin ich hier? Und warum nicht du? Oh, I love it. Yeah, that's yeah, no, it. brilliant. Brilliant film. An uh, unexpected uh, appearance with Peter Falk in there as well, which is, uh, which is a great piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, oh, great, don't start great. me, Ian. I love that yeah. movie. Yeah, we might. Uh, yeah, we might end up just doing a whole episode on uh, Wings of Desire at some point. You mentioned, you, you know, you mentioned going into Kreuzberg and the anti-American feeling there. Were you warned about the Red Army faction as well? Yes. And the dangers of that. What, what, what were you told? What precautions were you told to uh, take? Um, there was a, uh, a message board that we had over by uh, in, in my company. We call it a day room. And it would be, these are where all of the demonstrations are going to be. Um, as far as the Red Army faction itself, they seem to be more active in, um, in the West or closer to Frankfurt by Wiesbaden, around in there. There was a big bad incident in Wiesbaden, as I recall, um, you know, in Heidelberg. Um, so we were very much aware of them. Um, but at least to me, um, more of the demos were of the anti-American sort. Uh, these were students. These were squatters. Um, these were Turks. Uh, these were skinheads. And you know, basically, you name it. And there was a demo, um, at least five demos, and most of them anti-American. So we were always warned not to go to those areas, which made it, of course, irresistible to go to those areas. <laughs> and presumably in West Berlin, you didn't have to wear uniform either. You could... Go plain clothes. Yeah, Gott sei Dank. You know, thank God. Um, 
Well, you know, if I wanted a free U-Bahn ride, you know, that would be great. But, but yeah. given where I was going, um, yeah, yeah. So I go to them from a distance. Uh, I knew the, I, I grew to know the area so well that I never worried. Um, it's interesting. I talked to um, an East German who crossed the wall, you know, straight after the wall had opened and crossed into Kreuzberg. And they were immensely disappointed by what the West looked like because it, it, you know, Kreuzberg almost lived up to the propaganda the East Germans were telling them about the the ills of the capitalist West in terms of, um, you know, how people were unemployed and, you know, taking drugs and things like that. Oh, yeah. You know, hand to mouth existence. Well, it, it was, uh, look, it, it definitely wasn't Seelendorf. It certainly wasn't the Kudam. You know, it wasn't um, a fashionable area, but um, it had the canvas in. You know, Kreuzberg was the best wall graffiti that you were going to find was going to be there. The most interesting stuff um, you're going to find. And it had this vibe to it, um, different from like Greenwich Village here in, um, you know, in, in, in New York, uh, but like an alternative kind of view of, of, of things, I guess. Um, yeah. Well, an alternative lifestyle. I mean, a, you know, a, a very much alternative lifestyle of the squatting. And also in Berlin, you couldn't be conscripted into the West German army. So you had a lot of people fleeing conscription from West Germany um, coming to, to West Berlin as well. Were you there when the Labelle discotheque was blown up? No, I had just left. I had right, just okay. left, um, and I had, it, it, it all happened quickly. Major Nick, I think, was killed, and then the disco event. I think they were both pretty close to each other, but no. No, those I I missed. Um, I'd never been to LaBelle. It was, it was pretty much a place where um, fellas from, uh, from a different caserna, from, from McNair, usually from the infantry units, from what I understand in the MPs, I think they hung out there. You know, every, because every you know you had different places where different people hung out. I think you accidentally crossed the border at some point whilst trying to take a photo. Still have the photo. Yes, um, I had just gotten myself a real snazzy camera with this this killer telephoto lens and all this stuff, and um, I was um, I, I I basically did my usual. You know, I got myself over to um, Platz de Lüftbrücke, over to Tempelhof, and then I, I just kind of hoofed my way over um, to the wall. And I was just taking pictures, and then in, at an angle, I noticed this one sign where it said, you, you're, you're now entering the American sector. And I went, oh, oh, you I've got to have. <laughs> you I want. And I didn't realize it, but I stepped over the line. I had just taken the picture and then um, almost got knocked down to my feet. Uh, a West German police officer, he was pissed. He was furious. Um, it was on August 13th. Oh, right. Okay. So the anniversary of the wall going. <laughs> yeah, like one of those stupid well. things. Yeah. 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 Like, you so know. you crossed over the white line? Yes. Wow. Okay. And didn't realize it. You know, yeah. there you are. You, it, it's it's kind of like that 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 person who's trying to get that perfect selfie who falls off the cliff. I mean, duh. I look back <laughs> at it now. <laughs> I always it could have really incredible. been bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always found that incredible going to Checkpoint Charlie and seeing that white line and it being sort of like the fault line between the West and the communist East. Yes. And it was just like about an inch wide line of paint, but it was a real, you know, I, I just couldn't get my head, you know, the, my head, well, I could get my head around it, but that was one of the things I found fascinating about Berlin was that, you know, it's this major city divided in half on the basis of different ideologies you know, it would be like cutting London down the middle of Trafalgar Square and, yeah. 
or cutting through the middle of Central Park in New York or something like that. It was, it was the most bizarre place, but I'm so, so glad that I managed to see it before, you know, before it changed. And, you know, I went back shortly after it came down and uh, actually went to the Zentrum for their their let's give away all of this East German stuff because we're going to get all this cool other stuff now. You know, they, they, they fire sold everything and it was such a shame. Yeah. Um, even though I was thrilled with the bargains and everything. Um, but yeah, just going through and um, it was just, I don't know. You could, you could feel it giving way, but it wasn't quite there yet. But yeah. it was, wasn't it something? Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I've said this before, but it was a time at which I thought I'm actually living through proper history now. This, this is a, you know, a real um, important moment in world history. You know, you and I in the 1980s, we thought the Berlin Wall was going to be there for another hundred years. The Soviet Union was was always going to be there. And then suddenly, within the space of a few years, it was all swept away. Yes. I was elated and astounded at the same time. I could not believe it. I thrilled. But, but Ian, when I went back, um, they were selling um, not too far away from the Brandenburg Gate um, T-shirts that ich möchte meine Mauer zurück. I want my wall back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have Have you got any souvenirs that you brought back that you? Oh, many. Let's. Yeah, I've got. Uh, let's see. Um, photos, of course. Um, uh, pictures of the wall. Um, pieces of the wall, rather. I did my little wall dig when uh, when I returned after it uh, went down. Let's think. Of course, I have my commando badge and posters. So many, so many different um, artsy postcards. I used to. Um, that's what I liked about Kreuzberg too. You know, I used to go to the, like these these revolutionary art. You know, whatever they were. You know, Che Guevara. Yeah. Um, and have fun and just look at the artwork and look at the stuff. So I've I've tons of that. Most of my artwork probably is from Berlin. So yeah, I do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What no, I've you? got a big. I've got a big chunk of the Berlin Wall here that I picked up when I went back. So I picked oh, yeah. this up off Niederkirchner Strasse. And it's the, you can see the paint that side. It's, there's paint that side as well. So it's the actual thickness of, of the wall. And uh, yeah, this is, my, this is probably my most treasured Cold War memory, <laughs> this one. That's a thing, you know, you just... It's just extraordinary that you lived through it um, and that you've got something. I, I was just um, – actually, I, I was taken aback by the wall itself. Were you when you first saw it, like close up? Yeah, I hadn't imagined it being so high, to yeah. be honest. Or so concrete, you know, so gray, you know. I mean, I, yeah. I, guess, I guess I was kind of, you know, in the past about all of that. Um, but that really took me aback. What a great thing to hold on to because we won this one, all of us. And now I'm looking at what's happening here and now, and now I'm kind of wondering how deeply, how thoroughly did we win this one? There's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous patrons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a patron by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.
Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.